Good morning, everybody. And um, I'm sort of partly sad to say welcome to our last day of our ACIS seminar. It's been brilliant so far. And to ease the sadness, I'm actually really excited about today because we have some amazing inspirational presentations coming up. So I'm looking forward to that. So my first, um, my first request is if you could go back to your names and rename yourself. Uh, so it's your Christian name and surname and country code so that we can see who we're talking to and everybody else gets to recognize who it is that they're having conversations with. That would be lovely. And you can do that in the top corner of your screen. So this morning we are focusing on um, developing a great ACIS. I'm looking at inspiration from existing tools and initiatives. So this morning we have a number of presentations, uh, which I hope will do exactly that, which will inspire you. And hopefully there'll be some that you can think to yourself, oh, actually, I may take that one back with me because I think we can use it in our country, which will be brilliant, perfect, and exactly what we want out of this event. In the afternoon, we're moving on to strategic plans and interventions, where again, we have some presentations which I hope very much will inspire you. Uh, and also we're going to spend uh, a little bit longer in breakouts together than we've had the chance to so far, where you'll be talking about the strengths and weaknesses of your own ACIS systems, but also developing interventions together, which uh, I'm sure you guys are going to come out with some really creative and exciting interventions to look at building upon some of those strengths and weaknesses. But it's a jam packed agenda today, so I am going to hand straight over to Inga van Oost, who again is going to give us one of her wonderful overviews of the subject area we're talking about. So Inga, take it away. Good morning. Here we are with a session where you can lay down and just learn from other people and ins get inspired for good ideas. Ideas on knowledge as it was, we will get from the European projects and also from a national project. We will learn about farmer to farmer exchanges, including the typical on farm demonstrations and experimentations. And Tom from Ireland will tell us more about that. They are doing this for many, many years. A third issue, which is quite uh, a challenge, is how to reward researchers beyond just what they are usually rewarded for academic purposes, scientific publications. We have Mugur with us, a professor from Romania who works a lot with farmers and will bring his experience. And also Augusti, who made a dedicated system to quantify these efforts and who see this as a mission of their institute to really deliver information for farmers that is practically usable. Uh, the link to Horizon Europe is a challenge. And there you will see that Jean-Marc explains how from two operational groups and a European thematic network was built within total 10 different countries involved. And we also have a national rural network where a lot of activities are done to exactly increase this engagement with Horizon Europe. Janus from Seja then will explain how the creativity of young farmers can help as cat catalysts for innovation. We even have in one of our countries operational groups to help generation renewal. Interesting calls for operational groups is a key thing, of course, and Asa from Sweden will help us to see how simplified it can be done and how they can capture grassroots innovation ideas in the best way. Then comes Sean, who has a first with the use of operational groups for testing out new cap measures. Hardy will explain his view on cross-border operational groups. Johanna from Austria will explain how she, as an innovation broker from the rural network, promotes collaboration and knowledge flows among operational groups. And Pascal will explain to us how not only at EU level, but also at national level, 
Thematic networks can have great added value to mix and to produce trust between the different actors from which then innovative projects can grow. Last but not least, you will see great examples. Don't forget, of course, Raquel's example of the first day. But remember that it's just a snapshot. Many more things are possible, as you can read in the ACUS4 report. Tomorrow, you will get more ideas for ACUS interventions. And please don't hesitate to use this seminar to contact all our speakers for further discussion, for further questions. So let's start. Thank you, Inga, and I hope that whetted everyone's appetite of the presentations that we have to come. So we're starting with Peter from Ghent University in Belgium, who is looking at establishing knowledge reservoirs. Thank you. What would it be if you had an EU-wide system with one digital data platform in which practitioners would easily find practice-oriented knowledge, collecting all useful outputs from projects. There is indeed so much knowledge that is collected and generated by projects and that is lost. How to make everything more sustainable in the long term? I'm Peter Spanhoge and with the help of Sylvia Bursens at Ghent University, I'm coordinating two projects addressing this question, namely Eureka and Eurachnos. If you look at European projects, you know that they are generating data. These data, for instance, satellite data or temperature data, are not directly of use for end users. The translation of this data into useful knowledge is perhaps one of the most challenging tasks of a project. The end user wants practical output with a clear focus on the problem. With Eureka and Arachnos, we want to collect knowledge in a central platform. Outputs we are looking for should focus on practical solutions that farmer can apply or further innovate. We observe that materials that are visible and engaging videos or case study examples are the most powerful tools. What is a knowledge reservoir? Every product generates knowledge. Hence, every project is a reservoir of knowledge. But all this knowledge is not stored in a digital platform with searchable keywords. If we talk about high impact knowledge, then it's obvious that this knowledge has to be directly addressing the end user group, the farmers, the foresters, the advisors, or the educators. Not only the local language is important for high impact knowledge, but also the way it is presented. Videos are the most popular ones. If we look now at a digital platform, then it's logic that we say, okay, this platform has to be constructed according to the state of the art technology and that the data in it have to follow the fair principles. I'm proud to say that today we have the first prototype of our digital platform being tested inside the consortium. The knowledge of eight thematic networks is currently stored in it. Clear concepts and common easy language with an effective search function was looked for. The next step is now to build a community of practice to enhance the impact of our work. Having a central digital platform, call it Farmbook, is not enough to reach the end user. People love to speak to each other. Complementary activities should include face-to-face -face events, meetings and peer-and-peer -peer 
peer-to-peer -peer activities to include users who prefer non-digital means of, non of knowledge exchange, we have to pay attention for that. If we want to be sustainable on the long term, we believe that an EU-wide open source knowledge reservoir has to be promoted by all. We aim to become one EU-wide destination to store and organize resources from projects to enhance their impact. Erasmus and Eureka are building an EU ICIS. And you? Thank you, Peter. That was really exciting. And I love the way that you finished with a question as well. Um, we're going to move on quickly to Jintare from the Lithuanian Agricultural Advisory Service, who is going to talk to us about Titrus. Thank you, Jintare. Hello, I'm Gintare Kuczynskina from Lithuanian Agricultural Advisory Service, and I'm ready to read your presentation about how digital knowledge reservoirs and databases can support ARCIS. My presentation is based on our experience with work with national knowledge reservoir called TITRIS. We knew that there are a lot of already implemented projects, thematic networks, multi-actor approach projects, national operational groups and other innovative initiatives. And all the results and interesting materials are located in different web pages. From the other hand, we knew about obligation under post 2020 CAP to establish innovation support services in each country. So Lithuanian Agricultural Advisory Service made it last year. And when we started to work in innovation support services, we need, needed to have such tool for innovation and new knowledge sharing. That's why we developed TITRIS. TITRIS' object is non-commercial scientific research and practical innovations that have influence on sustainable agricultural production. We see three features that are seen as important for such tools. System must be free of charge, bilingual, national and English version. And in Tetris, you can find both version equal level. Information system of open access, we don't ask our visitors to register themselves. It's really a waste of time. The main aspects of novelty of Tetris, we see methodology. Methodology is based on understanding that even the best project results hardly could be embedded directly in practice. That's why we are working very carefully with our data provider and results in order to share new recording TITRIS. How TITRIS is being used by farmers and advisors? First of all, you can search in area of your interest or using keywords. Our abstract is very short and concentrated with information how, when, why. Here you can find visualization material with a lot of photo and um, video with subtitles. Record also has additional material with seven or ten pages translated in English language by a professional interpreter. And finally, from this page, you can contact directly with data provider. And the last my slide is about challenges that we face in process of feeding T-trees. First of all, time. Every record costs more time for administrator and data provider than we expected. And it's directly connected with quality of records. We see a big challenge to engage researchers in data provision. Of course, we think about how to promote this idea. We think the TITRIS could be not only a tool for innovation support service, but it could be used as a tool for all actors of ARCIS in Lithuania. And finally, resources, how to support the system. We calculated that to develop the system with three or four new elements and to speed up the record uh, amount to 20 or 30 new records per year, 
it would cost about 20,000 per year. So we are looking for financial instrument for this activity. Thank you for your attention. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, another really interesting presentation. So we've looked at establishing knowledge centers and digital knowledge reservoirs. And now I am gonna hand over to Tom from Ireland, who's gonna talk to us about probably slightly more practical organizer organizing farmer to farmer exchanges. Thanks, Tom. Hello, my name is Tom Kelly from Chagas and I want to share with you uh, our experiences of managing large scale peer to peer exchange programs, mainly through uh, uh, discussion groups and uh, demonstration farms in Ireland. Um, so there are four critical components in organizing peer to peer learning. Uh, having experienced facilitators, credible and detailed farm data, research, media and industry backup, and finally branding. And I'd like to talk about each one of these four just for a few minutes, very briefly. So facilitation is important. Um, advisors need basic skills of planning, listening, questioning, observing, controlling, timekeeping, etc. And it can be taught to facilitate group learning, and this is we generally use the sector modules to do this. And um, participants also need encouragement and involvement, and it's key whether it's in demonstration farms or discussion groups. Participants ownership of the processes is also important. I'd like to reference the Chagas discussion group facilitators handbook, which is published this year and I've provided a link for that for you. The second uh, component is uh, farm data and information. So detailed current and verifiable data, both physical and financial is important. Comparable data uh, using common benchmark tools uh, is available in, uh, or having it available in real time or at regular inf intervals is important. This allows farmers to compare data with each other and to, to make much more meaningful the, the uh, use of these data and metrics from different farms. Their involvement in the data collection and analysis is important. So we use tools like the Profit Monitor, which is a financial and physical benchmarking. We use the ICBF cattle breeding analysis and the, the, the pasture-based grass measurement database. We also uh, is, find that it's very important that there is research, media and industry backup. The consistency and complementarity of information within the wider ACUS is important. Farmers will be influenced more by uh, practices if the message is clear, consistent and repeated often enough. And we must always remember that every practice change on a farm is an experiment for that individual farmer. And it's really worthy of the interest of the advisor and other farmers. Two excellent Horizon 2020 project, the AgriDemo project and the Nefertiti project, examine best practices and the value of network, networking farmer demonstrations and uh, practices. Finally, I'd like to mention branding. And branding of initiatives is important in that it creates a profile for the activities and the events around that particular project or that program. It also identifies the advisors and farmers and other actors involved. Branding helps with media platforms and with industry partners who need to differentiate the initiative and evaluate its cost benefit. Two examples again are the the Kerry uh, Monitor Farm Program, which is over 25 years in existence, and uh, the, the more recent uh, Green Acres Calf to Beef Program, again, which is an excellent program. I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tom. Um, and as I promised, some really inspirational presentations to start our day with. Um, I've seen a few questions coming in, so hopefully all our presenters are, are ready to, to answer where they can. Uh, Mark, is there anything interesting that you've picked out? 
Yes, good morning, uh, Sarah, and good morning, everybody. Um, we do have a question for Gintare uh, in relation to the Titra system. Just uh, the, uh, I suppose, the, the question is around uh, user experience and feedback from uh, those, the target audience, I guess, farmers and, and advisors as well. So, Gintare, if you had any uh, information on that, it would be great. Yes, thank you for these questions. I, I see them several. So first about uh, feedback um, from advisors and farmers in Titris. Directly on the system, we are not collecting feedback and it's really important question for us. We still are discussing how to make it. And uh, I would like also to say a few words about collecting data and involvement of our data providers. It's a very important question, I think, because um, when we started to work, um, working with data provider, we see a very formal first step. We're providing first, for example, first data version uh, copy paste from a proposal or a report of results. But when we starting to work with the data, we analyzing them and uh, the data providers see that uh, his work is very important for us, you know. That's why the situation usually is changed and uh, usually we get from data provider very fast and useful feedback. That's all. You mentioned in your uh, presentation, Gintare, about that you were exploring funding uh, opportunities or routes for the, the system. Have you had any further ideas or thinking on that? We're still discussing about this with our Ministry of Agriculture, but uh, no any concrete uh, uh, news about uh, this financing question. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Gintari. And uh, I suppose a question also on the Erectus project, I mean, that same question in terms of future funding, how do you see the, uh, that, that, that project being funded and particularly the, the dissemination of the, the outcomes from, from the various projects and, and the organization of data um, and, and I guess the moderation of, of the information that's going into the system? Um, good morning. Maybe first answer a question. So the, 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 the draft version of the digital platform will, will, will be more open for testing around January. So this is the first point I want to say. The second point related to the funding, we have also the Eureka project. And inside the Eureka project, we will do that exercise. We will look how we can... Uh, uh, be sustainable and that's a task that still has to be done and this is also uh, with uh, collaboration of everyone so we meet we will look for input for everyone to think about it and that's very welcome if thoughts are um, can be provided to us so it means that um, it's of course a difficult question because we also have to look at the European Commission. So what is the possibilities over there? How, do, uh, how is their viewpoint on the long term? So um, with support from the European Commission, that would be also more uh, facilitated. So this is a little bit the point I can say for now, because uh, we, we, we have not worked more in depth on that. Thank you. And a question, Tom, you, you mentioned, uh, I haven't seen it in a Chagas presentation for some time, but you mentioned branding uh, as part of the uh, being important as part of uh, uh, c communications and, and uh, knowledge transfer programs. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, Mark. Uh, I think that you know we uh, we need to get into the into the heads and the mindset of of the audience, the farmers that are out there, and. Uh, promote the uh, the, the uh, project or the initiative that we're, we're talking about. So branding of a program is really important, um, but it's, it's important for the potential participants and participants in the program. It gives them an identity. It also gives the advisors that are involved, if there are multiple advisors involved in it, say in a national program, it gives them an, it gives them an identity. We've had lots of experience of this in, 
in terms of, I think I remember the cash in on grass program, Mark, you may even remember that. It's, it's maybe 25 years ago now since we launched that particular program, but it still resonates with people that this was about making more money from grass-based production. So, you know, I, I think that it's really important, but in the context of working in a broader industry landscape where you have uh, actors from, from, uh, from the ministry, from government, you have people from, from uh, the press and people from industry, I think it's also really important because they associate with this, they see it no different than branding their own products for sale in, to general customers. And Tom, just while you, you have the floor there, we have a really good question from Alvaro Jimenez in Spain here uh, about the role of industry in demonstration farms and, and activities. Uh, and the question is around how, how do we manage that uh, impartiality of advisory uh, and, and at the same time managing that relationship with industry? I know there's some, Chagas has a number of joint programs with industry. And how do we manage that? that uh, those, those sometimes different um, objectives? Yeah, well, well, I suppose first of all is that we are very clear with our industry partners that, that and many of them prom, are, are joined up. So for example, in the Green Acres program, there are several um, uh, companies involved in it that are actually competing with each other. Uh, but we do not allow um, them to uh, use the platforms within the program for promoting their own uh, companies or products. So we agree that there are uh, key initiatives or key uh, targeted changes that we want farmers to undertake. Uh, and uh, this might be around building up soil fertility. It might be breeding. It might be the type of animals uh, that are, are, are getting ready for slaughter or whatever. And we, we uh, I suppose, make a huge effort that we agree those with the industry partners and as such, we are all on the same track and we are all saying the same thing to the individual farmers, uh, but coming from different angles. So I think it's a really strengthens the message that we as a, as a national advisory organization gives if we have industry saying the same thing, if we have advisors coming from the, from the private sector saying the same thing, uh, I think it really strengthens the, 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 the message to, to, to farmers. I, I think it, it also gives... Uh, I suppose some a degree of credibility to the industry in terms of that they're doing something, giving something back to the farmers. And they generally pay us for the pleasure of being associated with some of these uh, projects. Programs. Thank you, John. Um, Inga, uh, I think, has hand raised. If you want to come in, Inga, on this conversation, please feel free to join us. Yes, um, I um, understand that at local or national or regional level, it's important that NACIS includes uh, not only farmers, advisors, researchers, but also, of course, businesses and commercial companies. Um, but we've seen already from experience that some of these knowledge reservoirs that have started a few years ago are quickly hijacked by some big companies like Bayer or Syngenta or whatever, who use it for promoting their own uh, uh, things they want to sell. So for us, I mean, at EU level, we would like uh, to look at uh, a sustainability solution that um, ensures that the knowledge stays public and impartial, I would have said. I, I put it in the chat public, but uh, in fact, I mean impartial knowledge, not influenced by any uh, commercial companies. It's the same principle as for advisors. We want to focus on impartial knowledge sharing. I think it's a, it's, it is an, a, an area that needs to be managed and uh, very delicately and uh, to ensure that you know, we, we maintain those, those strong relationships with uh, industry. Uh, unfortunately, we're just out of time for any further questions, but we, uh, we have captured your questions and we will endeavor to to, to answer them either uh, during the session or at uh, a later stage. So thank you to all of our speakers and panelists and uh, we'll hand back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Mark. And yeah, thank you to all of our panelists and speakers there. 
Um, please do remember that they are around for the rest of the day and you have their contact details in the app and on the participants email list. So if you have any more questions or you think about something in a couple of weeks time and you think, ah, Tom would know the answer to that, then please do feel free to carry on that discussion and carry on asking those questions. Brilliant. Um, we have a few more presentations coming up, but just before we do, I'm going to ask you to switch to gallery mode and switch your computer uh, video on as well. So again, we can see each other and I'm flicking through and seeing lots of pictures come on, which is brilliant. So in order to keep us going, uh, we're just gonna have a bit of a stretch around. So I wanna see your shoulders moving a little bit and maybe moving your arms around as well. So you're feeling a little bit better. This is part of our new EIP Agri Dance moves going on here, fantastic. And now what I'd like to try and do, which might be a little bit tricky, and um, when we've got the screenshots, hopefully it will work. But if you, can, if you can see yourself, just try and reach out and touch the sides of your screen and see if we can join hands across the whole of the European Union. So uh, just as, as if you're touching the sides rather than, rather than, uh, than uh, so I think I'm probably not. Yeah, Fabio, you have the plan here. Fabio Cuso, you, that's perfect. So just, so as if you're touching one side and then somebody could be touching your, your, the side of your screen as well. Now that's lovely. So we're sharing hands across the whole of the European Union. Perfect. Thank you very much. Give yourselves all a big thumbs up. That was brilliant. And uh, a bit of a wave and go back to speak of you. And um, I will we'll move on to the next set of presentations. So again, please do think about the questions that you would like to ask and pop those in the chat as they come up. So we're, we're ready to ask them on your behalf. And uh, now I'm going to welcome Murgaril from the University of Agricultural Sciences and Veterinary uh, Medicine in Cluj in Romania. So please take the floor. Hello to all of you participating in this AIP Agri seminar, dealing with such an important topic for the future of our agricultures and rural areas, the CAP strategic plans. My name is Mugurel Jita and I'm working as a full professor in the Department of Economical Sciences, part of the University of Agricultural Sciences and Veterinary Medicine from Cluj Napoca, Romania. In the next minutes, I will speak about our work with the agribusiness sector that goes beyond academic purposes. As a general context, the universities and research institutes in almost all member states are financed based on a performance-based system. In such systems, bibliometrics represented by publications number and journal impact factor are important elements that condition the institutional budget. Researchers and research departments are thus evaluated based on their scientific publication rate and impact. This does not encourage them to respond directly to different farmers' needs, because farmers usually do not have important research funds. The first example that, that goes beyond academic purposes is the Agro-Transylvania cluster. It is an associative structure created by a public private partnership in Cluj County to respond to the increased demand for the local agri-food products. It used both European and national funds. One key objective from the beginning is to develop research adapted to the members' needs. The cluster started its activity in 2014 and reached today 100 members. Our university and other five institutions represent the research and education sector. It, it is a multi-actor group that deals with multi-product value chains. In this way, it became representative for the entire agribusiness sector in another part of Transylvania. This allowed to participate in different European and national projects about precision agriculture, circular economy, or alternative public policies, to mention only a few. For a researcher, such a structure can bring both monetary and non-monetary rewards. First of all, we can develop strong scientific publications, but also we can directly provide advice or training to farmers. Then we can lobby 
for alternative public policies that can bring societal recognition or improve personal satisfaction. The second example is about expanding a thematic network in the area of high natural value farming. These are low intensive farming practices that support our rich biodiversity and beautiful cultural landscapes, among others. Over the past years, they are being threatened by intensification or abandonment. In the HMV Link thematic network, a team of stakeholders coming from 11 member states identify innovations that can support such systems. Although the project is ending now, we are still providing advice to several cooperatives about how to implement some success stories like the milking collecting points or the mobile slaughterhouses. The main reason to do that is your personal satisfaction that can contribute to the preservation of traditions and biodiversity. Finally, I will present the Agro Consulting Club that was supported by Puyul de Creești, one of the biggest chicken meat producers in Romania, Ubeme Feed, East Grain Trader, and Antal Jolt Foundation. This student club support the most promising students from our university in building extracurricular experiences and networks. Each year, the selected ones develop a professional project supported by practitioners. For example, in the last year, they implemented a farm management software in an experimental farm. The most important reason for doing that is your personal contribution to the development of a strong network of innovator catalysts in Romania. Finally, I would like to thank you for your interest in these examples. I try to answer to your questions using chat. For further questions, please do not hesitate to write me by email. At the end, I thank um, the AIP Agri Service Point and all stakeholders. Uh, those names wasn't mentioned here. Thank you all. Thank you, Megara. Another really inspiring presentation. And continuing on, um, on the theme of rewarding researchers and how to better develop those links, I'd like to introduce Augusti from the Institute of Agri-Food Research and Technology in Spain. IRTA is a public agri-food research and technology institute funded in 1985 with 10 research centers in Catalonia, a staff of 850 people and an average of 800 activities focused in knowledge transfer to farmers and advisors. These activities are attended by more than 40,000 people every year, and they constitute one of the three pillars of our missions to contribute to the advances of scientific knowledge, to help our sector to become more competitive, and to bring technological advances close to their final beneficiaries. We believe that things that cannot be measured cannot be managed. This is why we have implemented eight years ago a method to measure and reward our staff for the effort made in knowledge transfer activities where the final beneficiaries are the farmers and the advisors. Our T-index measures basically the effort made in full-time employee according to a catalogue of activities previously agreed with our users. Please meet Georgina, a researcher in the field of fruit production. Through an online web application developed internally, she can access to the different components of her T index. T1 informs about seminars, workshops, and meetings with advisors. T1 Prima shows her publications in technical magazines and T2 informs about the knowledge transfer activities of her department appearing in the mass media. Georgina can also get the average satisfaction mark from the participants in her activities. We have developed a unique index in its category that allows objective comparisons among our staffs. 
allows us to set goals and follow the map. And even more important, allows us to manage strategically our knowledge transfer and advising effort in order to conduct it to higher levels of societal impact and recognition. We are very pleased to have the opportunity to show our T index today, and we would be even happier if other research technology and institutions in Europe would like to share it with us. Thank you. Thank you, Augusti. That was, uh, was really inspiring as well and a really interesting index. I'm sure there will be lots of questions in the chat about that. And um, we're moving on to a slightly different topic now and looking at ways of supporting increased engagement with Horizon Europe projects, which I know has come up over the last day and a half together. So Jean-Marc, please tell us more about what you're doing in France. Hi, I'm Jean-Marc Gauthier. I work for the French Livestock Institute and I've been the coordinator of the thematic network Shipnet and Envolve as well in the operational group Robustan. I will share my experience that aims to create knowledge reservoir by farmers for farmers thanks to the power of thematic network and operational groups. In 2016, two operational groups have been set up, one in France, Robustan, and one in UK, Lifeland. As they were tackling the same issue, we decided to create a meeting between farmers from France to UK. The question after this excellent meeting was how to ensure long-term interaction in both ways with more countries in order to share more practices and solutions. How to capitalize all those collected and shared knowledge. Thematic network seems to be the perfect tool to answer to those questions as the aim is to interconnect operation group at national and EU level. Based on this, we set up ShipNet and connected 14 countries, seven at the beginning and seven join us during the project, and 19 national network, including five operational groups. ShipNet is all about practice-driven innovation and knowledge sharing. Within ShipNet, we created a knowledge reservoir by farmers to farmers. We collected 42 practical solutions and 88 tip entries. All those are available online and we advertise about them with social medias, but also using means of communication already trusted by farmers. Based on this knowledge reservoir, the French farmers involved in three national networks have purchased existing practical solutions adapted to their situations. So to conclude, thematic network and operational groups accelerate the flow of knowledge across Europe. In one hand, operational groups involve ACIS actors at national level. In the other hand, thematic network create the link between operational groups at national and EU level. Thanks to the multi-actor approach and to the national network facilitators that make this possible. Thank you for your attention and thank you for all ShipNet partners and to the funders. Thank you. Uh, again, a great presentation. I'm really excited about this morning. Um, on the same topic about engage and engagement with Horizon Europe projects, I'm now going to hand over to Jan from the National Rural Network in Germany. Good morning to everyone. My name is Jan Svoboda from the German Network Unit DVS and I report today what have we done to bridge EIP and Horizon. Okay, uh, ERP is well known. We have about 200 groups now um, and in different fields of activities. You see them here. Some calls are open, other are guided by themes within our 13 programs. Um, we started to bring op operational groups together with annual meetings. First started 2016, widened that 2017 and brought in people from abroad as well. You see them there. And uh, we had networks and um, um, multi-actor groups that presented themselves there. Uh, we go on 2018, 2020 is the same format, uh, exchange in marketplaces with poster. Uh, you see a picture on the right side, which gives you an impression what we have done. Um, 
<clears throat> During this events, we had also small uh, working groups and uh, there arose some questions about how can ERP groups and um, uh, work together with, in between member states. And uh, the question was then, uh, how can we com communicate cross border and the offer is then field visits to Belgium, France, and soon to Slovenia, uh, because we have COVID is uh, as a webinar and participants have a wide range from operational groups to advisors, everyone is invited, 50 to 60 people. Um, we started with thematic workshops then when uh, we had more operational groups and uh, they have to do some things themselves. They have to come up to us with an idea and must be four operational groups from two lenders at least. It's open for others as well, uh, as well naturally. And we take funding them, we organize the things for the seminar, sometimes bring in additional experts uh, for um, additional knowledge in this field. Um, we started 2018, we have uh, 8 to 20 partners each in such a meeting and uh, we have uh, again Horizon Networks in it and they presented themselves there as well. Uh, what are the lessons learned? Um, who's interested in preaching? It's mostly scientists. They have, um, they look for, for funding and they look as well uh, for new fields of activities and they have a certain time budget they can look at for themselves. It's not different to farmers. So um, as we have them um, all over Germany, it's important for us to bring them in closer contact perhaps that this group and we will do it in the future. On the other hand, we have these operational groups and um, there they are, uh, sometimes they are good funded with half a million, other, on the other hand, it's only 30,000. And so often it's not enough money for additional work. More flexibility would be good there in the future. Um, so as on, on, then they are restricted to the arrangements with authorizing bodies and they can shift easily into another direction. Okay, nevertheless for us, the most uh, attracting offer is interesting thematic relations combining all relevant players, then they will join our activities and our events. How we go on? Um, okay, we are doing AP films and project sheets, but this could be done better and AP films will continue. Uh, then the outcomes of national thematic networks can be capitalized better. We just don't have hadn't the time uh, till now. Um, so then we have started fostering exchange between advisory services in agroenvironmental matters, biodiversity, water and nutrient management, but there are other fields related to science as well, and we have to do more there. Overall conclusions, it's not really a systematic approach. It's try and error and sometimes it works, also not. Uh, it's related to people and we have to make and hold contact to multipliers and exp experts in different fields. We have to work with new networks to extend our own range, at least for in, in horizon uh, sphere. And we have to create open exchange opportunities as a network. So it's all about networking. Thanks for your attention and we go on with your questions. Bye. Thank you, Jan. Um, it's always about people and always about networking. I think we're finding uh, we now are coming to our last presentation um, in this lot, which is from Yanis from CJ, who's focusing on a slightly different issue around um, capturing the creativity of young farmers, another issue we've been talking about these last couple of days. So thank you, Yanis. Hi, my name is Yanis Maas. I'm a young farmer from uh, Belgium uh, and the chair of CJ, which is the European Council of Young Farmers. Uh, as in the European Council, besides the political representation and the network of young farmers, we also tend to work strongly uh, in, in the topic of uh, capacity building and, and knowledge exchange. Uh, and therefore, I would like to thank the organizers for, uh, for having us uh, in this uh, seminar. Uh, maybe the overall point when it comes to advisory is that it must be tailor-made. And tailor-made starting from the reflection and, and dynamic of the, the farmer and, and his or her farm. Uh, not from the reflection of a commercial interest or an ideological preference uh, concerning the farm. So farmers really need to get the feeling uh, that, that their interest is what is uh, at stake here and, and that everything is organized in order for them to, uh, to move uh, forward. 
Um, besides, obviously, the the the, the day-to-day -day, uh, advisory, we also tend to work uh, around the policy framework, which should uh, which should embody the, the 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 ambition that we have as European Union in uh, in advisory. Um, mm -hmm. And for that, we have uh, made an internal consultation. Uh, these are just the results. I'll, I'll go into the specifics uh, directly. Um, an internal consultation in which our young farmers have, have opened a bit uh, the, the ideas that they have, uh, which should be taken on board in the uh, strategic plans of the common agricultural policy. If I can, can highlight one, one point here uh, in, the, in the opportunities, uh, it would be the, the bridges between uh, farming community and research, the, the last bullet point in the opportunities. Uh, and, and the reason that is so important, and that also came out of the recommendations that our young farmers across Europe uh, gave us, the second point there on the slide, uh, is, is that if we have those decent bridges built between advisory services, uh, research, uh, uh, and the farming community, then that will also enable us to make sure that farmers uh, and young farmers in particular, but farmers uh, have a place around the table in creating, constructing that, uh, that very advice that they, um, that they will rely on. Uh, and and I, I would like to take my moment here to, to acknowledge uh, and appreciate the fact that many people, stakeholders within the uh, advisory community, uh, are indeed convinced now that, that farmers need a place on that table, not only at the very end of the, of the project or uh, at the very end of the, uh, of the uh, road, but, but from the very beginning, so that whatever answer the advisory is coming up with is, is actually an answer to a question which is uh, being posed. Um, but we also realize that it is difficult for our uh, for our young farmers to be involved in uh, in in that process, um, and on the next slide, I, I just want to relate a bit on on the, the main issues there. Uh, we we do see that it is difficult for an individual young farmer to uh, grasp the added value for him or her to be involved in such a project, and so for for on on the short term, it is mainly time con uh, time consuming to be involved, uh, and that doesn't make it easy. Uh, for a farmer to, to, to go away from the farm and, and take time to, uh, to, to serve the bigger good, which is uh, the essence of it. Besides that, our farming representation, which is very strong in Europe, uh, mainly organize themselves around uh, political topics. Uh, that is what we do at CISA, that is what many farming organizations do. Um, however, it isn't so easy to feel representing uh, the, the voice of farmers when it comes to, to on-farm technology, when it comes to innovations in the, in the farming sector. Um, and, and that is a difficult uh, sentiment to, to move beyond uh, as an individual farmer around, uh, around that table. Um, if I can take some time to, to uh, prioritize one last message that I really hope will be, uh, uh, will be the one thing you remember uh, after this presentation, is that innovation, and, and that is wh why we are here, we want to uh, see an innovative uh, farming sector, we want to move the farming sector forward, whether it is via technology, whether it is via new marketing systems, whether it is uh, uh, via, via new ways of producing. Um, innovation is, is at the core, uh, but innovation has, has three main pillars. That is research uh, and, and development, which, which are at the center of, uh, of many policies. But that research and, and development is, is useless if it is not implemented at farm level. Uh, and that is also the reason why it is so crucial that farmers have a place uh, around the table to, uh, to, to ensure that uh, whatever that research and development is coming up with is also practically applicable and will be taken on board uh, by farmers, farmers and, and the white farming uh, community. Um, I hope that this was a bit clear. Uh, obviously, I think there is a, there is a chance to ask questions uh, here during this webinar. And uh, if not, uh, please do connect with, uh, with CISA. We are uh, enthusiastic to uh, tell you more about knowledge building and advisory. Brilliant, thank you, Yanis. Um, always interesting to hear the perspective from young farmers in, in any seminar, so thank you very much. Um, wow, that was quite a lot of information all in one go and some really inspiring presentations. So I'm glad that uh, all of you presenters helped me fulfill my promise at the beginning of the day. Um, so before we break for coffee, we've got a few minutes to ask some questions. So if I uh, welcome Mark back, um, what have you spotted, Mark? Hi, Sarah. Yes, some, some interesting, really interesting questions coming through. I, I, I have to say I particularly enjoyed that last presentation, some, a lot of common sense there. So it's, uh, it's great to, to see that uh, the, the young farmers are, are very much involved in this process. 
Um, we have a question here for Agusti. Um, so uh, Agusti, this one is for you. It's, uh, if I've understood well, uh, the T index takes into account that, uh, dissemination actions and realized innovations. Do you have uh, or take into account efforts towards supporting innovation that are focused on dissemination? For example, cooperative research or technological offers and are uh, not finally successful uh, within the time frame you are calculating the T index. I guess that's annually. So maybe you could uh, enlighten us on that one, Augusti. Of course. Uh, can, can you see me? Yeah. Yes, we can see and hear you, yes. Okay, so th thank you for your question. Thank you, Mark. Uh, this, uh, there is a component of the T index which takes into account the success in bringing innovation to the market. This I could not explain it for the short time I, uh, uh, we had. And this uh, component of the T index is linked to a success. If you do not succeed, you would not uh, um, account uh, a value on, on, on this index. And then we, we, we do not have only the T index. We have the R index, which is the research index, and the E index, which is the economical uh, value of your work for the organization. And in this sense, cooperative uh, projects with other institutions having failed or not, this would be accounted in the E index. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Augusti, would you agree that there's a cultural dimension to this? Uh, because I know from experience for, uh, in, in Ireland, for example, if researchers are applying for a promotion, for example, it's generally papers published and uh, how does that translate or is that that T index something that's uh, used uh, throughout the organization? It, it influences definitely. We have a kind of two-step promotion process. The first step is the conditions you must fulfill to access to the promotion. And the second is the promotion itself. Our system to open you the door to our promotion system takes into account the value of your T index in approximately one third. That's great. Thank you, Gusty. That's, that's, that makes it very clear. Uh, we have, uh, I suppose, a comment uh, from our colleague in uh, the Irish Ministry for uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, Patrick Barrett. Uh, and his comment is in relation to uh, an earlier conversation we had with uh, Tom around impartiality. Uh, he says that impartiality is very important to generate advice uh, that takes into account all aspects of economic, social, and environmental sustainability. And that there are, however, there may need to be, we may need to consider how knowledge distribution can be scaled and the role public-private partnerships may play in the need to scale and change behaviors and practices. So uh, without a doubt, um, uh, industry and uh, the commercial uh, world have a huge role to play here in uh, in terms of um, disseminating and um, scaling out those messages. Um, we're quiet enough otherwise, that, uh, Sarah, on questions for this particular session. So uh, I'll hand straight back to you, I think, and uh, we'll pick up again after the next session. Oh, brilliant, thank you, Mark. Uh, I think we're sort of overwhelmed with the amount of amazing information that was made available to us there. So again, I know I've been saying this a lot, but please do connect using the app and also using the participants list. As we said at the beginning, this is very much the first steps around building an ACIS community and we want this community to carry on developing beyond the end of today. Sarah, I just noticed, Sarah, that Inge might like to comment on her. She has her hand raised there, Inge, if you'd like to, to add to that previous conversation. Well, uh, just uh, very shortly, maybe uh, you remember I already touched upon the subject yesterday that um, our operational groups, they can be financed up until 100%, which is very important to keep uh, the, the knowledge that comes out public. And we always have to be vigilant that if we go below that 100%, like 70% uh, and, and the operational group would need to look for 30% co-financing, that you really risk that private companies use your operational group to do things that they otherwise would do with their own research and development uh, money. So in that sense, I think 
Um, it's fine to be open to private uh, public uh, um, uh, uh, projects, but be vigilant that uh, the privates are not dominating and misusing your public money for their own purposes. Thank you, Inga, uh, and that's a really, really uh, excellent point, all right. Um, Sarah, sorry for interjecting on you there earlier, but uh, hand back to you there. No, it's absolutely fine. Inga is a fantastic resource to have. She is, is the brain full of ACIS, so um, it's wonderful to be able to tap into that. Um, just before we go for coffee, just uh, a couple of people have been asking about whether we can save the chat and then send it out afterwards, which I'm reliably informed by people that understand the technology way better than I do, that yes, we can do that. So yes, we will. We have been saving it as we go. But if you want to save it yourself, if you have the chat open in the panel to the right of your computer, you'll see three little tiny dots in the right corner. If you click on that, you can select save chat and then you can keep it for yourself as well which is brilliant because this is an indication of just how interesting the discussions are that are going on in the chat in the background. Um, so brilliant, carry on doing that, carry on using the chat as much as you want for questions, but also for comments and observations as well. So we have our coffee break. And again, as I always have to remind you with the coffee breaks, do not leave the Zoom meeting because it's really difficult for us to get this number of participants back in on time otherwise. So feel free to switch your microphone off and to switch your video off, but please do not leave. And we will see you back here at 9.50, um, ready for our next session. Thank you. Hello and um, welcome back from coffee and yeah now we're looking at further inspiration for you ACUS planners out there and for this section between now and lunch we are focusing mostly around operational groups and thematic networks so it promises to be a really interesting session um, but before we start um, as you will recall from the last two days, we've had some participants that very kindly sent in their photos of how they got through lockdown. And I would really like also Broberg, if you could unmute yourself and um, we will pop up the photos that you sent in for us. And perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what's going on here, Orsa. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm coming from Sweden, as uh, some of you might know, we did not have a lockdown in my country, but we tried to keep things going and uh, open, uh, but we did have a lot of restrictions. And one of them was that we were not allowed to be more than eight people at the cineta cinema, which is in the right picture. So when we wanted to go to the, to the cinema, we had the theater all of uh, our own my family and a friend of mine and his family. So it was a funny feeling uh, in all this uh, sadness and fear. The second picture is me as a forester. And as uh, Shane told us the other day, he had time, more time to spend with his sheep and, and uh, cows, I think. Uh, I could uh, spend some more time uh, to take uh, care of my forest while not having to travel all this distance to uh, my office in Stockholm. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Orsa. And thank you so much for sending those photos in. Um, you're actually presenting for us in a moment, so I'll give you a second to prepare. But I'm, I'm loving the whole only eight people in the cinema. It's like, it's like living in a very large and expensive house and having your own screen to go to. So uh, I'm sure that was really enjoyable. So yes, Orsa is also our first presenter. She is from the um, RDP Managing Authority in Sweden and has been working on preparing interesting calls for operational groups. So Orsa, thank you for talking to us about that. I will now hand back over for your presentation. Thank you. Hello. I will give you an introduction to the discussion about operational groups by telling you some of the experiences from one of the Nordic countries. Uh, my name is Osa and I work for the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation in Stockholm and I'm charge of EIP. 
we have put a lot of effort in innovation throughout the years in Sweden. For example, Swedes invented dynamite, the zipper, the furniture system of IKEA, and actually also the refrigerator. But as you know, innovation is not easy. It takes many skills and a lot of brain to come through, and you cannot know from the beginning which ideas will be successful. Therefore, we have a two-step system in EIP, and uh, through this uh, period of the Rural Development Programme, we have had 211 operational group working. And keep in mind that Sweden is not a huge country when it comes to agriculture. To us, so for us, 211 is a lot. The two-step system consists of group support and project support. Anyone that has a good idea and can gather advisors, researchers and entrepreneurs in a group can apply for a lump sum of, of 5,000 or 8,000 depending on the group size to set up a group and to write the project plan. This is the first step and the Board of Agriculture has selection meetings every month The second step, that's where you apply for the actual project money. It's more complicated and only 25% of the operational groups that go further on with a project application do get funding. There is no obligation to start with the group support, uh, but my experience is that most of them do. Uh, however, there is a back door if the operational group finds out that the idea is not good enough or if there's already a solution of the uh, invention that they were working for, they can keep 1500 euros and then they don't have to spend time and money to write a meaningless project plan. And we can save the rest of the lump sum for another group. So. Um, this is uh, not, this means that we don't have waste of money with this back door. Uh, a few words about the support in the early stages. We have something called the Innovation Support Service and it consists of skilled, ind skilled individuals that help people with good ideas to discuss the ideas further and also to find people that can be in their operational group. Of course, by now, there are many advisors and researchers connected to clusters or incubators that do have good experience of working in operational group, and they often can facilitate the process as well as act as brokers. Finally, some challenges for the discussion. We have more than 200 groups, but we cannot find, finance more than 25% of the project applications, as I told you. Do we kill too many ideas from the operational groups, or is this just the right balance uh, of finances for operational groups and projects? I don't know, maybe you have a good thing to say here. Secondly, as we all know, inventors, they are normally not very interested in administration and maybe the two-step system with the group support and the lump sum reduces the feeling of administrative burden. What do you think about that? Would this be a solution to find the real inventors? Thirdly, how can clusters and incubators be used even better to start up operational groups and good projects. And fourth, what are important ingredients to develop efficient innovation support services? Uh, what are your experiences and how can we take all this further in the next period? So I hope this was some kind of inspiration and uh, see you out there in uh, the reality and on the chat. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you also and really interesting to raise those uh, challenges at the end of your presentation as well so thank you for that hopefully that will inspire some conversation in the chat as well as some questions later um, now i'm going to hand over to shane conway from the nrn in ireland uh, who's going to talk about how they've been using operational groups to test out new cap measures which sounds really interesting away you go shane hello everyone 
Uh, my name is Shane Conway. I'm a researcher at NUI Galway, working on the National Rural Network Project here in Ireland. My presentation today, as you can see, is on the use of operational groups for testing out new CAP measures. Uh, to begin, um, here's a breakdown of the Irish operational groups, essentially a family of measures here. There's the two themed projects um, agreed with the Commission as part of Ireland's Rural Development Programme, the Hen Area Project and the Pearl Muscle Project. Um, large projects uh, recruited by competitive tender. And then we have the two open calls uh, for environment and the general call, uh, bottom up operational group calls recruited by a simple application process and most importantly, designed to be accessible by all. This uh, process resulted in the selection of 23 operational groups uh, located throughout the country, as you can see in this map created by the National Rural Network. Um, the great thing about this is that the um, different farming systems and typologies across the country are represented here, um, be it from the upland areas to more pasture-rich grazing, uh, dairy environments, and also the island communities are represented um, on the Iron Islands there, for example. So leading on from this, I suppose the most important uh, message I want to get across here is Ireland's approach towards EIP Agri. This uh, locally-led, farmer-centred, results-based approach. This is the, the key message. So involving farmers from the get-go in the design phase and then throughout, this flexible, practical, locally adaptable measures. Um, for example, farmers making decisions on a field-by-field -field basis. Um, and also, of course, the results-based approach. So rewarding farmers for um, you know, making improvements in farm biodiversity and other public goods such as water quality, um, protecting wildlife, for example. So it, it's a really key point as well, this results-based, results-oriented approach. And also, of course, a lot of lessons have been learned from the Burren programs experience in relation to all this. So in relation to supporting the, the operational groups, the Department of Agriculture and NRN um, held a, a number of knowledge transfer and exchange workshops uh, at the beginning and um, providing um, the, 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 the multi-actors involved in these projects, be it the advisors, the farmers, the researchers, um, with the, an opportunity to exchange ideas and to listen to each other. And now there's, and now there's a, quite a few of the thematic kind of uh, groupings coming together, for example, the upland operational groups are coming together to share ideas. And when we talk about the Hen Harrier project and the Pearl Muscle project, you know, a lot of money has gone towards this, you know, 25 million for the, per, for the Hen Harrier, per 10 million for the Pearl Muscle. But it's not just about species conservation, there's a knock on effect of habitat protection. So the Hen Harrier is a good indicator of ecosystem functionality, and that in turn illustrates that there's a good um, habitat. In, in that area. Also with the, the um, pearl mussel, there's an indicator of water quality with their presence. So the symbiotic relationship exists. Um, and essentially looking ahead that these operational groups are intended as preparation for future CAP agri-environment climate interventions post-2020. Um, and the department are taking on board lessons learned from these existing projects in the next phase. And here's an example of, of another few projects that they're learning from, like they are for their, all the rest. And now there's a new peatlands call um, to inform CAP strategies in the area of farmed peat soil. So that's another key area because of uh, the, in relation to carbon storage and sequestration. Um, the operational group booklet produced by the NRN on behalf of the department includes all the aims and objectives activities and objectives um, of the projects. And it's, it's a useful tool if you want to learn more about the projects. Also, we have a one-stop database on our website, including all um, social media, for example, um, websites, uh, contact details. We have a new blog that gives representation to farmers on the ground by giving them a voice. They can share their ideas, farmer to farmer, and general public can also um, see what's going on. And also because of the COVID-19 pandemic, some of the groups now are holding um, virtual meetings, such as the Pearl Muscle Project. And this is another form of ACAS and key form as we move forward. Um, to build this social inclusion in times of social distancing and knowledge, knowledge exchange is as important as ever. But again, the on the ground actions remain key and a blended approach is now necessary, combining digital measures with um, you know, hands-on knowledge exchange activities and strategies which follow these COVID-19 guidelines. And just look here at the McGillicuddy-Reed CIP project doing an excellent job on such things. So 
thanks so much for your attention. Um, the main thing message I want to get across is the locally led, farmer-centered, results-based approach. That's Ireland's key um, message that we want to bring forward. And um, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shane. Yeah, we definitely did enjoy that. Another really interesting perspective. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Hardy Tam from the Estonian Dairy Cluster, who will be sharing with us his experiences of um, cross-border operational groups. Thank you, Hardy. Good morning. My name is Hardy Tam. I'm chairman of Estonian Dairy Cluster, and I have been asked to share with you our experience how to build cross-border operational groups. The cluster itself was established as NGO 2015. We have 23 members, seven partners from different R&D institutions. And importantly, we established, already in establishing uh, NGO uh, implemented APCRO principles, uh, although the registration itself took part two years later. Uh, most of our, mostly our uh, members are farmers, uh, also, to dairy companies, one dairy society. And importantly, we have chosen a focused approach. That means uh, cluster deals with innovation that are the only and Estonian Chamber of Agriculture and Commerce as one of our members deals with other issues. Um, besides of our innovation projects, we also have uh, contributed into Estonian uh, rural development plan, long-term strategy and some other issues. And uh, that is the way how our members see us going. From activity report, uh, it's important to say that before one may think about cross-border cooperation, um, our, its capability and interactive network are important things to think about. So we have received several fundings from other measure, uh, first in 2016, uh, for our wider program and second for digitalization in 2019. So for that moment, we have worked for some years when we have signed a cross-border cooperation with Finns. That is the first example in Europe and we are leader of this cooperation. And we, can, we can confirm that this cooperation has been useful for both sides. Both countries has been has got new uh, Project Finns 2019, we 2020, and we have recently uh, submitted another uh, application together with the Swedes and Germany. So we have increasing our network. Um, also, should be looked uh, difficulties in uh, cross-border cooperation, and uh, mostly that is dependent on member states' interest. They are typically would like to support their own regions, even in circumstances many of them can't arrange cooperation between its own regions. Bureaucracy in many countries is a problem, but also uh, these groups are very different. Are they ape groups or operational groups? Uh, uh, many of them can be very small, depending on legislation. But important is, to say that this regional, regional cooperation has been very positive and very uh, strong influence. So it shouldn't be seen in conflict with if those intentions where the uh, reach to global level is, is intended. Um, typically, OG ability is weak. That means wider or larger funding are unreachable and uh, the biggest problem is synchronization. Uh, um, so we, we see only member states perspective, not EU. And uh, we don't demand that on, on measure level. From our experience, we can confirm that specific incentives are definitely needed. That means uh, if we look our case uh, from four calls, only one uh, was where cooperation partnership was mandatory. Information about Finnish and Swedish groups was available. Other countries didn't have call coming, and we were able to find a similar topic for out of two Finnish groups. Uh, Finns got extra points 
that cooperation wasn't necessary. Swedes were more region focused, but as you see, synchronization is problem, and we didn't receive any info that before our uh, attention, any partnership were looked for. In terms of suggestions, timing is crucial. If you would like to do that, you should demand cooperation in measure and probably offer extra points as a bonus, higher funding rate or higher maximum funding level for cross-border cooperation projects. Also, think about operation groups capability building. Uh, they need to overcome language and cultural barriers. They need managerial skills much more. And if you are arranging cooperation, what do you expect from it? Do you uh, select topics from uh, long-term aims of EU, or they are still membership aims? Do you see complementary or concurrent skills? And importantly, if one partner fails, will then both fail simultaneously? So success, one plus one is more than two. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hardy, and I really enjoyed that last slide. Um, of bringing those two operational groups together is greater than the sum of its parts. And I know that all of us have experienced transnational corporations have definitely done that. Um, so we're now moving on to uh, Joanna from the Austrian um, National Rural Network, and she will be talking to us about collaboration and knowledge flows between operational groups and how they've sought to promote that within their NRN. Thank you, Joanna. Hello to everybody. My name is Johanna Rohrhofer and I'm part of the Austrian Rural Network. I'm happy to give you a short presentation about how to promote collaboration and knowledge flows among operational groups. First of all, I want to give you a brief overview about we, how we are organized. So we are an outsourced body from the ministry and we are four partners who are collaborating together and I'm part of the innovation. I see myself as an enabler and therefore I support all the 30 operational groups here in Austria. The groups are in all different project phases and they are active in all different agricultural fields. For better knowledge flow and for collaboration, we heavily use the different existing database bases and we search for OGs who are active in similar fields, in similar topics, and then we try to link them. We also organize events where we bring together operational groups with other stakeholders. So end of this year, we, we are planning for end of this year, we are planning one, which we call getting the right people together. And it's a kind of speed dating where the participants have to get to know as many different projects as possible and to discover the possibilities of co collaboration. And we bring together operational groups from Europe with stakeholders who are interested in a, co in a collaboration. Last but not least, I want to talk about the challenges. Sometimes it's hard to find updated information in the databases and valid contact details. Sometimes it's hard to find relevant information about the OG's work in English. And we also ask the OG's to tell us what's the challenge, what the challenges are. And they told us that there are too many networking events. So we really try to, to create events where there is a common interest or a common topic. And they also told us that they would need some support in finding the, the possibilities to collaborate because there are various possibilities. And last but not least, they told us that there are too little resourcing for meeting, for get to know each other, especially um, after the official project end. So thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Johanna. Really interesting feedback there from the operational groups in Austria and some of the challenges they face when endeavouring to cooperate better together. Um, we're now going to move on to Pascal Bezere, who is going to talk to us about the added value of thematic networks at a national level, bringing um, his experience from France. Thank you, Pascal. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my presentation will be about an experience with the French thematic networks, the mixed technological networks, or RMTs. What are RMTs? Uh, well, their aim is to enhance collaboration between research teams, advisors, and education teams on specific topics pertaining to sustainable agri-food systems. Uh, their composition is compulsory. They need to be at least three technical institutes or agricultural chambers, one agricultural school, one research organization or higher or education organization. Uh, of course, other stakeholders are welcome in the network, uh, private sector stakeholders, NGOs, farmers, etc. They were created in 2006 under the umbrella of the Ministry of Agriculture in France in consultation with with what we can call traditional actors of the French ACIS, uh, well-known ACTA, ACTIA, and the agricultural chambers. Their funding is through the Ministry of Agriculture, and the participants of the network also participate in funding. Uh, they are selected through calls for tender on a competitive basis, uh, with a five-year agreement for the selected ones, and uh, this agreement is renewable. Uh, the thematic areas covered are very diverse. There are 22 uh, R R R R RMTs at the moment uh, covering uh, agricultural production, livestock, food processing, data management, food quality, local food, etc. An example of such a network, the uh, RMT Livestock Housing for the Future. The purpose of the network is to enhance exchanges between specialists of livestock housing for horses, pigs, ruminants, and poultry uh, to anticipate changes in the sector. Uh, its composition is conformed to the requirements with three livestock technical institutes, five regional agricultural chambers, two agricultural schools, two higher education organizations, and also in our, uh, belongs to the network. Uh, its deliverables uh, is mainly repositories of technical resources, of methods, and bibliography. They also provide expertise, they conduct foresight studies, and design prototypes. They are in connection with the European thematic network, ShipNet. So the advantages of the RMTs, there is a social dimension. Uh, they build a community of expertise, mobilizing various points of view, and also it's stable in time with five years agreement uh, renewable. They can be considered as incubators for innovative and multi-actor projects. Education is a compulsory dimension of the network, which makes them very original. A wealth and variety of subjects, of subjects are covered, very diverse and they are in connection uh, with the H2020 thematic networks. However, there are some drawbacks to them. They have little resources and also the participants uh, have uh, little time uh, to devote to the network. It's, it comes on top of everything else. The cross-cutting themes are underrepresented. It's more like a sectoral approach. Uh, new emerging themes also are underrepresented, maybe because the participating organization are what we can call traditional members of the ACIS. There is also a challenge to direct, directly include private sector uh, stakeholders, including farmers, because of time constraints and lack of resources devoted to the RMT. Although, of course, the members of the network regularly interact with farmers and enterprises. So challenges for the future to finish with? Well, one challenge is to establish better connections between those French networks and the European dimension. Another challenge is to better connect with operational groups of the EIP in France, aiming at reaching advisors and farmers better. And also we could wish 
for some impact on education and curricula. Uh, there are agricultural schools belonging to the network. And by mobilizing the French networks of agricultural teachers, there are, there, there are some networks also among teachers, we could, uh, we could hope that the deliverables of the thematic networks, the RMTs, are more translated into the curricula. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pascal. That was again another uh, really inspirational presentation. And I think it's always really helpful when somebody that has that kind of experience can also identify what some of the challenges are, because I find we often learn more from each other's challenges sometimes and successes. So thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, and I've seen lots of really interesting conversations going on in the chat. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for that. And so I'm going to hand back over to Mark again. Uh, to see if there's any questions there that have really caught his eye or any issues that lots of people are talking about. Mark. Yes, Sarah, thanks uh, for that. Um, yeah, a lot of, lot of very interesting conversations going on on the chat and uh, it, particularly around uh, this, the Swedish example that was presented. So Asa, there were some questions there in relation to the, uh, the work that you're doing there. Uh, particularly around the, the linkages between the various different ministries. Um, uh, Michael Kugler, I think, has, has raised the point here uh, about the connections between the ministries on innovation. And um, Alistair Pryor from Scotland asking here, uh, saying that he sometimes thinks that agriculture in particular isn't that very well connected to other government departments. And are we missing opportunities here? I know from looking at the Google Docs that uh, you had uh, your, your national, uh, I think is it the science strategy, uh, incorporates uh, an ACUS uh, subgroup as well. Uh, maybe you, you could elaborate on that for us. Uh, well, yes, uh, we have a ministry, our ministry is called the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation because and, and there is a Department of Rural Affairs within the ministry, and this is where we have issues connected to forestry, fisheries and agriculture. For us, these uh, sectors is a part of the enterprises, so that's why we are part of the ministry. However, it hasn't been like this for, for very long, but we are trying to connect uh, to each other. Okay, that, 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 thank you for that. And, and just uh, while we're, we're speaking about uh, Sweden there, there's a question here in relation to the status of ISS, which I presume uh, is, means uh, Innovation Support Services in Sweden. And uh, the question is who works for them? Is it advisors or is it brokers? Uh, well, there, there is one person uh, that works at their rural network who works all the time with this, but that's only one person. And then we have had calls uh, to ask people with special skills, like in in um, uh, in um, well in, in different fields, like dairy farming and techniques and so on. Uh, and they can be from different places. There are some people normally working at the university who works part time in the uh, uh, innovation support service and that there are specially skilled farmers that also have part-time in this innovation uh, support service. So there can be different uh, skills and that's what we were aiming for. And, and finally, uh, so the, the funding, what mechanisms behind your innovation support services, how does that work? Uh, well, part of it is paid by the rural network. And then there is another part, and I'm not really, really sure where the money comes from, but I, <laughs> I think it's from the Rural Development Program. But I asked the Board of Agriculture to, to answer the question, but I didn't get, uh, get the answer on the chat. I don't know if Shell maybe has um, something to say here. Okay, we can, uh, we can maybe follow up on that. If, if I might move to Shane. Uh, Shane, uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, a question here in relation to the role of advisors and uh, innovation support services in the implementation of operational groups in Ireland. Is there an opportunity there for greater involvement of, of these people in operational groups in Ireland? Uh, hello all. 
Um, of course, but I suppose in relation to Ireland's case, um, it has already been possible for advisors to be able to feed in throughout. Um, I suppose this has got to do with the scale of the projects. Whilst we may only have 23 and they're quite large and the majority of them are actually making an impact on the ground in relation to their scale. So advisors are feeding in, uh, be it private or of course in Chagas, you know, they have experts in the field of botany, crops, bioeconomy, etc. So um, definitely the, the advisors have been involved and of course again as I go back to the whole point of uh, the seed has been sown so to speak and we're, we're learning it's growing and it's growing and we, it will continue to grow so um, all this is going to feed in so of course the advisors are, are key to all this and uh, you know I always go back to the whole like it's important to have knowledge transfer but I really see the importance of knowledge exchange as well so advisors to farmers and farmers to advisors so that would be um, kind of a comment on that. Thanks, Shana. Yeah, there's a lot of, I think, people looking over the fence and seeing how, how these uh, operational groups are performing. But I, I think uh, uh, people are starting to realize the, the benefits. Uh, just another follow on question, Shane. Um, in your presentation, you showed most of the operational groups are focused on agri environmental type measures. Are there any non environmental type projects uh, or ongoing or in the pipeline? Yeah, of course, you know, the predominant focus under this particular development program was on the environmental themes. But if you look um, towards the open call, the 4 million open call, um, there's uh, operation groups on maximizing organic production systems. Uh, that's got to do with supply, ch supply chain. And uh, OV data, um, that's got to do with genetic recording and improvement of commercial sheep industry. Um, and then we have three bioeconomy projects as well. And I suppose, um, you know, whilst, the, whilst you may, it, 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 of course, it seems that the environmental team, the majority, and there's a lot of money being spent, you know, there's, there's huge knock on effects towards this. And that, that has an impact on the rural economy. So this whole results based approach um, is another form of income for farmers. And this in turn helps the broad sustainability of rural society. So whilst, you know, on face value, but it may be environmental and I think that it's important to, you know, there's a booklet there that you can read into all this and you can see the huge scale and impact of these projects. So yeah, the open call, going back to your, I went on a tangent there, but the open call for sure, um, it looked beyond the environment. So that, that should answer that. Thanks Shane. Um, and we have a question here for Hardy here in relation to uh, the linkages with leader. Um, the question is from, from Alistair uh, Pryor in Scotland. Um, he talks about EIP cooperation. Is there something we can learn here from leader cooperation in terms of alignment of rules and so forth? Uh, perhaps you'd like to comment on that, Hardy. Hello, uh, again, um, like I mentioned in, in this uh, chat, it's a little bit depending uh, of the groups. If we would like to put together groups which are so far are contributing to regional level, then these are good. If, if you are putting together regional group and some kind of uh, global level intention uh, 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 development, then they, they may not fit together. Okay. And, and just a I think there is certainly a way to learn because I, I think that this operational group might be one of the future tools, not only uh, for cooperation, but also revitalization of agriculture as such, offering new challenges, for instance, younger generation of, of agriculture or people who would like to stay out of urban area, but still not be clearly farmer. So all these managerial issues, all others will be, I think, highly appreciated into this uh, kind of uh, settings. Thank you, Hardy. And another follow on question here uh, in relation to the JPI. What do you think of the JPI approach? Uh, why not a common plot to fund operational groups cross-border uh, uh, projects? Mm, here, I think um, I have made some proposals to Inges uh, that uh, if we make some pilots, if you like to learn how these things works and have some pilots and then uh, select topics and then fund also those uh, things uh, uh, like from the one central point, not necessarily from member state, then we could have a quicker learning curve compared with this trying to synchronize different member states. But here I think maybe it's appropriate to ask Inge to comment uh, how she would see this kind of uh, initiatives uh, developing because it's uh, some kind of uh, slow pace 
uh, learning, I think. Inge, are you, are you free to comment on that for us? Well, I can give my personal comments um, in the sense that uh, the moment uh, we drafted cross-border operational groups in, um, we were assuming that we could build on leader experience. But the longer we are uh, listening to people and looking to examples, the more we start thinking we need to develop a specific approach. Already Hardy, um, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, already Hardy uh, explained that uh, it's not the same, eh? uh, going more countrywide or even global uh, instead of territorial. Um, I think what we now will start is to try, and that not only depends on me, but also on my colleagues in the research team, because we have all our wishes and our uh, subjects that we want to put in. But uh, one of the things I would like to do is, is to test it out first with the Horizon project, to see how we can develop better this cross-border approach um, within the whole new ACIS approaches. So this would be a sub part eh? um, and, and get some people together to reflect on, on how this could be done. And um, maybe with some pilots um, and then see how it goes on. Uh, we can always adapt regulation, but we don't do that every year. That's so clear. Um, this, this period, we had one uh, omnibus regulation in the middle. So at such occasions, you might be able to adapt regulation. But in the current regulation, uh, there is no EU fund for cross-border groups. The idea is that um, something is arranged that these cross-border groups find each other and that's clear. I think that that's really for the networks to organize and then also for the managing or uh, managing authorities to follow because they have to do the calls simultaneously uh, as Hardy uh, said. So look to the timing, look to the conditions and enable this. But um, I do have the feeling that uh, there's more and more openness and, and willingness to go that way. So with maybe uh, a dedicated event or, or some extra efforts from our networking side at EU level and, and through uh, developing and collecting more views and, and, and ideas as we did in our e-questionnaires, but, but then at a larger scale, from all 27 countries, because we are all different, you know, so uh, it's going to be different. Um, we, we could collect the right knowledge to know how to do better and maybe at a new scale organize something, but it, it's not ready yet. It, it's surely still immature. And what's, what we have now is uh, each country finances his part of the cross-border group, and you have to prepare for that through NRN work and through managing authorities talking together, exactly as the project of Harlitam uh, started up. Thank you, Inga. And that brings us to uh, an end to our questions and answer session for this particular part of the day. So, uh, Sarah, I'm going to hand back to you. But just before I, I do, uh, there's a few questions come in from some of the other speakers. Uh, including Pascal, uh, and perhaps Pascal, if you had the opportunity to maybe to reply to some of the questions within the chat, I think uh, people would really appreciate that. So, uh, Sarah, uh, we'll hand back to you then. Thank you, Mark. I think it's an issue of all the presentations being so inspirational. That means we have so many questions. But as I have said before, please do carry on talking in the chat, but use your app and the participants email list as well. Um, so it's that time of the day where we just need to ease our back a bit and flex our fingers out, which inevitably means there is another participants poll. So this one is focusing um, very much on what you've heard this morning and uh, your feelings about that. And there may or may not be a question that's about the broader ACIS family. I think this might be the one. So the poll question is, which of these people is not an ACIS. So you could go for A, B, or C. So who do we think is not an ACIS?
So we have, um, mo most people are going for the sheep, but we do have some people that are, that are going for either of the gentlemen in A or B. I think people are trying to work out whether we're running a double bluff here or not. So we've had nearly half of you vote, which is lovely. Ah, brilliant. So 55% of you believe that the sheep is not called a kiss. So I admire the fact that there's 45% of people that somehow think I have gone out and found a sheep called a kiss. But that is in fact the right answer. The sheep, as far as I'm aware, is not called a kiss. Uh, a is Timothy Akis, who is an artist from Papua New Guinea. And if you haven't seen the painting that he has created around his natural environment, then he's definitely worth Googling. And uh, B is Akis Pathetis, who's an architect in London, who was going to try and get a film to us as Eric Akis had, but sadly it didn't quite pan out. So yes, answer C, the sheep is not an Akis. Let's go on to our second question. So, have you heard something surprising or new this morning that you weren't aware of before? It's like, yes, these initiatives are really relevant for my country or region, with examples I've not heard of before. Well, partly, these are interesting initiatives and several of the examples have given me some really great ideas. Or, well, no, these initiatives are great, but they're all different to what we need for my ACIS. So please vote away. Uh, I think this is always useful for us to know, but I think it's also really useful just to generally see what your feelings are and what might be going on in your ACUS. So we, we only have, it's just over a hundred of you have voted now. We only have, I think, four who are saying that they may need something different, but 77% of you are essentially saying that there's just some really good examples there. Um, which could be useful in your own ACIS. And 20% of you are just saying, yeah, these are great. This is just what we need. So that's really good news. And again, an indication of just how inspiring the presentations were this morning. Some really, really great projects there. So your third question, have the speakers given you an idea for something new you'd like to develop for your ACIS? So you can click on yes, I've got lots of ideas in my head now and I'm excited to start developing them. Um, partly, I had some ideas and these examples have helped me think them through better. Or no, these examples are great, but I'm not sure any fit with my ACIS or we're already using something similar. Okay, so th these have definitely been an inspiration as most of you, I think nearly up to 100 now and 70 to 70 percent have said that these examples they really helped you think through better the ideas you already have which is great and I think again an indication that we're all sort of part of the way through our ACUS journey so these presentations are really inspiring us to just refine our ideas and, um, and think them through a little better. So um, our final question what do you think about using operational groups to develop new CAP measures? So we heard some examples there of what's happening in Ireland. So not necessarily. Our administrative staff are competent enough to do it themselves. Um, good idea, as it's promoted earlier to the farmers and future beneficiaries, giving a faster start for the measure. Or great, as a co-creation between all involved, farmers, advisors, researchers, businesses, NGOs, etc., and in particular, the future beneficiaries will make the measures much better than usual. So I think we have our, our clearest front runner for this one. And uh, just around half of you are saying, yeah, co-creation will make the measure much better than usual. Oh, and then we have some uh, kind of gaining a little bit we're going to promote it earlier to farmers and future beneficiaries so they have a head start on making the best of the measure. And a few that are saying that actually your administrative staff are competent enough to do it on their own and don't necessarily need that input. So yeah, half of you are looking at co-creation, which is really exciting. And hopefully uh, some of the examples today will help with that. 
brilliant. Uh, so that's as hard as we're going to make you work on the poles. Um, and before lunch, what we would uh, love you to do um, is we're going to send you away again on some blind dates and give you an opportunity to discuss what you found most inspirational about the presentations this morning or the thing that's made you think most about what you've heard from our presenters. So the same as yesterday, it's completely random. We don't know who you're going to end up with, but that's what makes it so flipping exciting and give you an opportunity to ponder that question amongst yourselves and then we'll come back and have a chat about it. So away you go. Hello and welcome back everyone. I'm just, uh, I'm just watching everyone move back into the room so we may have a few more to come but I just had a very interesting conversation with Maria and Pacom so thank you both for that. Um, there is an opportunity if you wanted to pop anything in the chat that really inspired you in the conversation that you just had. Um, so feel free to do that. If you had a particularly great conversation within your blind date then just type in the thing that, that that stood out most for you. So we've got that recorded, which is always really nice. And I think we're back up, just looking at the participants numbers, I think we're back up to our participant number. So before lunch, we're going to send you out to the breakout, to the blind dates once more. So you'll hopefully have a whole new set of people that you can share your inspirations with, or even share your challenges from your own ACUS, as it was nice to see some of the presenters share the challenges around their projects. So um, Get your screens on so we can see each other and away we go for some more blind dates. Um, a few of you have put some, some comments about your chats in, uh, comments about your blind dates in the chats, which is really interesting to see the kind of things that everyone has been talking about. So um, in mine, I had Stephanie from Sweden and Alexandra from Tuscany. Uh, and Stephanie was really interested in the work we did yesterday around uh, training advisors and how to improve the knowledge base of advisors to support them then to be developed, to be working through ACIS. And Alessandra said something really, I thought really lovely and really interesting, that this seminar so far has helped her kind of get the pieces of the ACUS puzzle together in order that she can start getting it right and support others to understand it better in her area. So I'm very proud that we've achieved that for Alessandra as well. So against the odds, after finishing slightly early yesterday, we are also finishing slightly early for lunch today. Uh, so this may be a theme that we can continue. So do remember over lunch, um, you can switch off, you can leave the room if you want to, because we can check you back in as we have a little bit longer over the lunch period. But equally, if you want to stay, do feel free, just switch your video and your audio off. Um, we are checking in at 13.40, so please do join us from around then, particularly if you've left the room and need to be able to get back in again. Um, Otherwise, we will see you back here to kick off at two o'clock. So thank you all the presenters for a wonderful morning and Mark as well for spotting all the, the fantastic questions that people have been asking. Um, for me, it's been really inspirational and I hope it has for you too. And we will see you back here at two o'clock. Thank you very much. Have a lovely lunch. Thank you.